we're going to start today with the Torah portion by trying to tie it into last night's class about, I think we covered about four seals. We reviewed the first two seals, and then we looked a little more at the black horse and the pale horse. And I wanted to pull some of that into the Torah portion because it's implicit in the Torah portion that not only is the wicked lamp being dealt with with the unsealing of the seven seals in Revelation, but we can also see that the wicked lamp is being dealt with because of the slander of the spies in the Torah portion. And so we're dealing with the same sins here. And we're dealing with the same lack of faith. And if you haven't had a chance to listen to last night's class, we read out of Hebrews 11 and 12, because it was directly related to what we were reading about in the judgments of the seven seals. And it's also related to our Torah portion, because we have the hall of faith um, in chapter 11 of Hebrews, but then we go on to chapter 12, and we really understand the point of our suffering, of our tribulations, of, of the hardships that we go through, that it's part of the correction and the discipline of the soul. Most of us like to get up in the morning and think we don't need correction, and the spirit thinks otherwise. So the Father has devised obstacles and decreed obstacles in our paths to um, disciple us in his ways, even when we don't think we need it. I can't tell you how many times I have said, I don't need this. I don't need this in my life. And apparently the father disagrees because he keeps putting it in my life. So uh, <laughs> embrace it was the message because it's in those obstacles that he's preparing us to stand in an evil day. And he knows exactly how to craft us and to shape us into those vessels that will continue to stand. Um, I want to start out reading from Job 31. Job is kind of a mystical book in a lot of ways. I mean, any five-year-old can condense the story into a few sentences. A really nice guy with a lot of stuff has some really bad luck, <laughs> gets really sick, loses everything, and then in the end, he's restored. Short story. But it's in the dialogue. Um, the comforters, part of that dialogue, of course, is prophetic, even if it's not very helpful to Job. But it's in the dialogue that the Holy One is having with Job. And, it, you know, Job reaches a point where really, what can he say? It's not much of a dialogue. It's pretty one-sided because he's being shown how foolish and small he really is. But in chapter 31, Job makes this speech, and I want to, to relate it to our Torah portion and as well to the, the seals that we read about last night. He says, I forged a covenant for my eyes, and I would not gaze at a maiden. Hmm. That's an interesting way of referring to your own eyes because we normally don't think of eyes as making a covenant. But when we look at his sentence in context, he says, I forged a covenant for my eyes and I would not gaze at a maiden. In other words, he's saying, I made a commitment that I would not look lustfully at a woman who was prohibited to me. And Yeshua teaches about this. He, he issues something called a pasuk uh, in the Jewish tradition, which is a ruling based upon an, a, a literal, actual verse out of the Torah. And it seems like a lot of times being disconnected from Jewish tradition, when we read the psukim, they to us, tend to be kind of disconnected from the Torah itself. And we're saying, how do they have the authority to make this ruling and say that it's based on the Torah? I don't really see that connection at all. But in today's Torah portion, we get to see very specifically the Torah 
portion and the Torah verses upon which Yeshua bases his pasuk when he says, if you just look at a woman to lust after her, then you've already committed the sin in your heart. There's a basis for that. And even here in Job, he's going to expand on a pasuk that Yeshua actually verbalizes for us in uh, Matthew 5, 27 through 31. So Job says, I forged a covenant for my eyes that I would not gaze at a maiden. Why then is this my portion from God above and the legacy of the Almighty from on high? Behold, calamity is for a perverse person. Okay, at this point, we already know Job is wrong. He's not a perverse person. In terms of his generation, he was a righteous man. And it was because of his righteousness that he's being tested. But from his position, being on the receiving end of plagues, basically, he has made the same mistake we've all made. We've all come to a point and said, okay, I'm doing the right thing. I'm trying to live righteously. I'm trying to live according to the commandments. I'm trying to be nice to my neighbor. I love God. And so why are these horrible things happening to me? And like I said, there's no good deed that goes unpunished. That's the way it feels in this life. And Job makes that statement for us so that we can see he also has a misunderstanding of how this life is conducted as we await for resurrection. He says, calamity is for a perverse person, disaster for those who commit iniquity. Not right now, not as a general rule. Calamity and disaster is coming. It's prophesied in the book of Revelation on a worldwide scale. It doesn't mean that a, a a wicked person or a perverse person will not run into the natural consequences of his sin. He will eventually. Um, he'll hit that wall. But in terms of awaiting God's direct intervention on a global scale against wickedness, against perversity, we don't see that until the book of Revelation. And we only saw it once before in Bereshit and the judgment and Noah's generation, the judgment of the water. But so in between these two judgments, we're kind of stuck with the mentality that, hey, if you're wicked, isn't the calamity supposed to fall on you? Isn't the disaster supposed to fall on you? So why is it falling on me? Job has the same mindset. He says, does he not see my ways and count all my footsteps, whether I went with falsehood or if my feet hurried to deceit? Right there is your fifth abomination, feet that run quickly to evil. The covenant with my eyes, or the covenant for my eyes, I would not gaze at a maiden, that goes back to a proud look. A proud look is an owning look. A proud look wants to acquire. It's a Cain, Cain look. So he's saying, I've kept my eyes, all right, from looking at things I shouldn't look at. I've not been proud and thought I was entitled to lust after this woman, which would eventually lead me astray. I've guarded my eyes. I've watched my feet. He says, he's seen my feet. He's seen my ways. He's counted my footsteps. He knows that I'm not running quickly to evil. It says, let him weigh me in the scales of righteousness, then God would know of my integrity. If my steps ever veered from the proper way, or if my heart ever went after my eyes. Now right here, again, he's made this allusion to something in our Torah portion where he says, if my heart ever went after my eyes. Okay, this is found in our Torah portion in Numbers 15, 39. And remember this, this statement occurs after a Shabbat violation. And you say, well, how is a Shabbat violation equal to slander? 
because we're in a, a Torah portion where the, the, the main context is going to be the slander of the evil spies against the land itself. Well, in the same way that you can slander the land with words, you can also slander the land, which is the, the principle of Shabbat is embedded in its earth. See, even the land has to rest. The land has to have its Sabbath or judgment eventually comes. So when we see a man who's violating Shabbat, even in the wilderness, he is slandering the land the same way that the ten spies did. We don't understand the consequences of speaking evil of the land. We just don't get it. We read about it, but at no time allow something negative to come out of your mouth about the land. And that's what people, they don't understand. If they just don't understand Shabbat and they keep their mouth shut, fine. But if they see you observing Shabbat in the wilderness, on your journey, you're not there to the land yet, but what are you doing? It's like Hebrews 11. You're keeping the Shabbat in faith that one day he will bring you into that land, put your feet into that land, a holy land that requires its Shabbat, faithfulness in Shabbat, and in your act of faith, you are preparing yourself for that land and you are not slandering it. You're speaking good of the land when you keep Shabbat even if you're not in the land. That's our pattern in the Torah portion. They're in the wilderness. And so this guy, he goes out and he's, what is he doing, picking up sticks? What is he doing? He's slandering the land. He's saying, he already knows that being in the land, Shabbat is a prerequisite. If you want to live in the land and do well, you keep Shabbat. He's in the wilderness. He's not there yet, but he's saying we cannot ascend. Because if he believed that they could ascend to the land, then he would be practicing Shabbat wherever he was because he never intended to go into the land. He was not required to keep Shabbat in his heart. We can see the faithlessness. So in verse 39, uh, of course, they say, okay, put the tzitzit on the corner of your garments to remind you. It says, it shall constitute tzitzit for you, and you shall see it, and you shall remember all the commandments of Hashem and perform them. And you shall not spy. There is a word that we don't always get in the English translations. Um, and other sources. This is a, an art scroll, Tanakh. So in the Tanakh, it's preserving a word that relates it to the entire Torah portion of Shalach. He says, and you shall not spy after your heart and after your eyes after which you stray. So the tzitzit, it reminds you of the covenant it reminds you to guard your eyes like Job says he does. Because when you guard your eyes, you're also guarding a heart from devising wicked plans. You see how it's hitting here all these points on the wicked lamp? And instead, it's, it's holding up the menorah, the spirit of Adonai, the spirit of the Torah, the spirit of the covenant itself, and saying, this is the true light that will guard your eyes. Why? Because eyes are one of the metaphors, actually, of the Holy Spirit. And if you guard your eyes, then you'll guard your heart. Because remember, it's in the fourth position. It's the middle of everything. Like Yeshua is in the middle of the lampstand, he's the heart of the Torah. He's the heart of the spirit of the Torah. And what does he teach us to do in Matthew 5, 27 through 31? Guard your heart. Why? Because if you're looking at a woman to lust after her, it didn't start with your eyes. It started in your heart. 
And once it hits your eyes, it's going to bounce back because see that menorah is a closed circle. Now that you've seen the whole menorah, I didn't bring my menorah in here, but if you put the rainbow on top of the menorah and you visualize the rivers of Eden, you understand that in light and in your spirit, these are closed circles. But in the same way, your wickedness is also a closed circle. That's why it's so hard to break out of wickedness. And the rabbis say that Lashon Hara is the, the, the most difficult wickedness to break out of. Because most of the time, you don't even know you're doing it. You know, what gets me is I've heard people say, well, I shouldn't be saying this, but... Well, see, that's worse because you already know you shouldn't. I say enough stuff. I just, like, later it dawns on me, I shouldn't have said that. It wasn't my place to say that. But then if you already know you shouldn't be saying it, and you say, well, I shouldn't be saying this, but... Now you've got a deeper problem within that closed circle, and it's just going to pick up speed. Think of an ice skater. You know how they do those really fast things where they spin round and round, and the circle gets tighter and tighter and tighter? Let's see, the faster you spin, the faster you spin. The more you sin, the more you spin in the sin. That would make a good title or something, but <laughs> I'm always thinking that way. But we see right here, the actual Torah verses that not just Yeshua is teaching from, he's saying, be careful with this closed circle of sin. Because once you get some, some speed with it, it's going to be hard to slow it down. And he goes on and he starts talking about eyes in that same context. If you want to go through after class and read the full passage there from Matthew 5, 27 through 31, you can see how he's linking everything in the same context. It's not just your eyes, it's what's going on in your heart. And that evil eye of wanting to acquire everything you see, what is that? It's a proud eye. It's saying, I deserve. I deserve everything I see. And I wrote down something Um, it says, when you become aware of something you believe you deserve, you fall spiritually. So we can't ever get up in the morning believing we deserve something. We don't deserve anything. Anything he gives us is gravy because every morning when we wake up, it's die new. If all he ever gave me is what he gave me up to today, it would be enough. It would be sufficient. Why? Because his grace is sufficient for me. Even when I don't understand, even when I'm having my Job moments, his grace is sufficient for me. Even when I'm crying out and saying, calamity is for a perverse person. What am I doing that's perverse? I deserve better than this. And he's saying, no, babe, <laughs> it's by my grace that you receive anything. And so Job goes on and, and he makes a really heavy statement. He says, let him weigh me in the scales of righteousness. Then God would know of my integrity. Well, as we looked at the black horse last night, the rider is holding a set of scales. So, Job's maybe a little over the top here, but still we can see prophecy embedded in his words. That there is going to be a weighing on the scales in the book of Revelation, and it's going to be scales of righteousness. Um, and remember that the context of those scales he's holding up, he mentions four products. He mentions the wheat and the barley and the relative cost that is about to be judged, because he's, he's coming out as the third seal opens, which would line up with the first fruits of the barley. Okay, it's the third feast. But he says, do not harm the oil and the wine, because the oil and the wine would come in at Sukkot, which is still several feasts away. It's at the end of the cycle, rather than 
wedged up in here at the beginning with Passover and unleavened bread. That's all kind of occurring there within that same week. So we're on the extreme spring as opposed to these other two products that would be an extreme fall of the year, what we would label the fall of the year. Scripture doesn't really label seasons the way that we do in English. They kind of have summer and winter. <laughs> so you have to know the seasons by the feasts themselves. So he mentioned something here, the scales of righteousness. He said, if my steps ever veered from the proper way, or if my heart ever went after my eyes, again, he mentions your heart can go after your eyes. He's talking about the wicked lamp. Or if anything ever clung to my hand. Yeshua talks about that in Matthew 5 when he talks about the evil eye. Then may I sow and let another eat, and may my produce be uprooted. If my heart was ever seduced over a woman, or if I ever lay in wait at my neighbor's door, then may my wife, well, that's kind of graphic, grind for another man, and may strangers kneel over her. For that is licentiousness, that is an iniquity for the judges to punish, for it is a fire, it consumes unto doom, and it would uproot all my produce. There again, it's pulling up imagery from Revelation of the, the great harlot, right? And the idolatry that is equated with adultery in the book of Revelation. If I ever spurned justice for my servants and maidservants when they contended with me, then what could I do when God would rise up? When he would attend to me, what could I answer him? Did not the one who made me in the belly make him too? Was it not the one who prepared us in the womb? Never did I withhold the needs of the destitute, nor did I let a widow's eyes long in vain, nor did I eat my bread in solitude so that an orphan could not eat from it. For it raised me since my youth as if it were a father. That's a strange turn of phrase there in the Hebrew. Um, and I have practiced it from my mother's womb. Did I ever see a forlorn person without a garment? Or was there ever a destitute person without clothing whose loins would not bless me, who would not warm himself by the shearings of my sheep? If I ever raised my hands against an orphan, though I saw I would be supported in judgment at the gate. Then let my shoulder fall from its blade and let my forearm be broken off from my upper arm. For the fear of God's punishment was upon me and I could not bear his burden. If I ever put my trust in gold or ever set of jewels, this is my security. That should recall to you some statements made to the assembly at Laodicea. If I ever rejoiced because my wealth was great or that my hand had attained much, if I ever saw the sun as it shone or the moon as growing glorious and my heart was seduced in secret, my hand pressed against my lips, that it would also be an iniquity for a judge to punish, for I would have denied the God above. Or if I ever rejoiced at the downfall of my enemy or enthused when misfortune befell him, for I did not let my palate sin to request his life with a curse. Or if the people of my household did not say, if only we could get his flesh, we would never be sated. No sojourner ever slept outside. I opened my doors to the street. Or if I ever covered my sins as a man does, hiding my transgression in my heart. For I used to strike a great multitude with awe. But now the basest of families frightens me. I am silenced, unable to go out the door. Who will grant that someone would hear me? My desire is for the Almighty to answer me. Let whoever contends with me write a book. I would carry it on my shoulder, bind it as crowns upon myself. I would tell him the number of my steps. I would draw him close to me like a prince. If my land would shout out against me, or its furrows would weep in unison. See, even the land will testify. That's why Shabbat is so important. If I have ever eaten its yield without payment or embittered the soul of its owner, then in place of wheat may thorns emerge, and in place of barley, weeds. And then it says Job's words have ended. 
So again, thematically say, well, how do you tie that all together? I don't really know. <laughs> but what I'm telling you is, I haven't read it long enough, but what I see all through this chapter is repetition of things we're reading about in the book of Revelation, especially when he ends with the wheat and the barley that we would associate and the scales that we associate with the black horse or the third seal, which again is going to be a feast of first fruits. And he helps us to understand this tour portion, which Yeshua did, obviously, but even before Yeshua, Job is writing about making a covenant with your eyes so that your heart will not stray. And it's, it's given in the context of a violation of Shabbat. He says, okay, now I want you to put these, basically, a tzitzit. It's a word that is similar um, to a word we find in the Song of Songs, where it says, peering through the lattices, uh, metzin. And if we have time, I'm going to go to the Song of Songs and show you some really incredible, I don't think they're coincidences. But it's very specific. He says, you shall not spy after your heart. Right? So the heart and the eyes are spies. Your heart and your eyes are spies. And what your heart and your eyes spy, your tongue will tell. It says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So they're all in cahoots. That's why you see it on, all on the wicked lamp together. What your heart and your eyes spy, your tongue will tell. All right, so let's go back to the beginning of the Torah portion. Let's see. Shut this book. And we'll go to this book. We'll go back to the Torah portion itself. So in the context, and just as a reminder too, we, we have to look at the words in the hood when we're looking at the commandment of tzitzit. And that word actually means an appendage, something that sticks out. And it, it's almost saying it, it, it is like tying something on your finger. It's, some, it's putting something on your human body that's not normally there. <laughs> and if something's not normally there, then it reminds us. Um, of what it's symbolizing. But in the context there, just um, slip back there again to chapter 15, let's say a 30, 1530. And again, it goes back to the wicked lamp. Remember, we've got proud eyes. Um, we've got the tongue. We've got the hands. We've got the heart. We've got the feet. So in 1530, it says, A person who shall act high-handedly. Go back and read that in the Hebrew if you can. Uh, whether native or or a convert, a gear, somebody who's coming in from the outside, he blasphemes Hashem. That person shall be cut off from among his people. For he scorned the word of Hashem and broke his commandment. And it says that soul, that nefesh, will surely be cut off. Its sin is within it. Now, that's a key turn of phrase for us as we've been looking at the disposition of the spirit, the body, the soul, the neshama, post-mortem. And looking at the sacrifices and the Levitical instructions as giving us hints as to what happens post-mortem and at the first resurrection and the second resurrection. 
this little clue right here really helps us understand why a soul is cut off. It says it's because its sin is within it. So see, the spirit is going to go back to the one who gave it. That's not the part of you that sin that came from God. That's that's something that's pure. Now the sin in your soul can sicken your spirit. Isn't there a part of you, a, a righteousness in you, that when you see perversity and sin, that it just makes you sick? Right? It's making your spirit sick. Because your spirit knows truth. Your spirit identifies with truth and justice and faithfulness and goodness. And when your spirit sees those things, it's going to feel sick. At what it's seeing and if your soul has been trained to follow your spirit then it will also make your soul feel bad you'll get a you'll get that bad feeling all the way down to the soul level it will begin to express ooh, that's not right so when someone is unrepentant and, and that's the, the pattern here, the rabbis say, when, when the, they found the man who was gathering the sticks on the Shabbat day, they're looking at a Hebrew turn of phrase where it says in English, those who found him gathering wood brought him to Moses and Aaron and to the entire assembly. They placed him in custody for what should be done to him had not been clarified. And so uh, they're basically interpreting this to say that they warn the man, they go out there like, hey, you're picking up sticks, you can't be doing that. And he would not repent, he wouldn't stop. When you won't stop what you're doing, you're not very repentant. And so at any point in this process, it's gonna take a long time for them to get him from the outside of the camp where they're gonna say, you can't be doing that. All the way to the Levitical camp, where Moses and Aaron hang out, that's a long haul. And at no point in this process do we hear him saying, I'm sorry, sweetheart, could you run get a lamb? I misunderstood, you know, let's, let's do this offering and, and make this right. All the way up to the, the point where it says they, they, it says pelt him with stones, but that, that Hebrew word there, um, I think it's coming from Oseh, means like do him with stones. <laughs> uh, I'm not really sure why that is, but um, the key there, going back to that, that context, the words in the hood, is back to the blasphemer. See, somebody can blaspheme and not understand it. A lot of people blaspheme and they don't understand what they're doing. But this death penalty or this cutting off, it's a virtual death as opposed to the actual death that is executed upon the Sabbath breaker. That tells you how important the Shabbat is. He actually got put to literal physical death. Now we go back here to the blasphemer uh, in verse 30. He says, that person shall be cut off from among his people. That's called karet in Hebrew. It says, for he scorned the word of Hashem and broke his commandment. That soul will surely be cut off. Its sin is within it. All right? So if you warn the blasphemer and he will not repent, the penalty is to cut him off. Basically, he's not welcome anymore. And in some cases, they say within just a few generations, their, their family line will die out. They will be unable to reproduce. I don't know whether that's correct or not, but that's, that's the tradition. But the idea here is if he won't repent, the sin is still dwelling within the soul. If we can get the sin out of the soul, then he's welcome to stay. He says, oh, now I understand what blasphemy is. I have to stop that. The Sabbath breaker, when he was unrepentant, he was literally killed. So it's two types of death. One is a virtual death, 
like when they put Miriam outside the camp. She was, she had leprosy and she was described as like one born dead. So there's an aspect of life, but you're living in death. And so that sin remains in you. How do you get back in? You get the sin out of the soul. Right? And, and that's what Yeshua came to do, to get the sin out of the soul so you don't have to be cut off and live on the outskirts. And it's just, it's a shame that so many Hebrew Roots people are cutting themselves off from fellowship. Um, that's considered pretty severe in the context of Scripture. And, and I understand that this is a new thing in the earth, and sometimes the fellowship just isn't there. It's just not available in any form, acceptable or otherwise. But as much as lies within you, you're supposed to live peaceably with those of like kind and like mind. Otherwise, you know, you don't really have to wait to be cut off. It, I guess it can lead you to cut yourself off if the sin remains within you. All right, now we'll go back to the beginning of the Torah portion uh, in chapter 13. And I, I'm always looking here for our rapture words since we found so many of them rapture, <laughs> not rapture. Just act like you never heard that. Uh, so many of our resurrection words uh, in the book of Aikra, now I'm hyper alert and I'm, I'm starting to see them everywhere, especially if you do your pre-reading in Hebrew. Um, it helps if, if you can even sound out the words. You may not know what all the words mean, but you already have a pretty good vocabulary, even in English. Uh, and if you can get a side by side and where you feel like this might be an important word I'm reading in English, if you can go back over to the Hebrew or use one of those Bible tools, say on Blue Letter Bible or Bible Works, you can pick up on these things where um, it says in verse 17, Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, and he said to them, Ascend here in the south, and ascend the mountain. Okay, so you've got a doubling of a word that means to go up, to ascend. And why are we interested in ascending? Because of Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, where it says um, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And so in this Torah portion, we are going to have ascending associated with going into the land of Israel, which I think is where a lot of the rabbis are getting the idea that the exiles will return in that cloud when Messiah comes, that they'll, they'll be flying home in the clouds. And I like that. I like that. All right. It sounds good to me. It, it sounds as cheaper than a plane ticket. So he says, ascend here in the south and ascend the mountain. So he wants us to ascend, ascend. And it says, so they ascended in verse 21 and spied out in the land from the wilderness of Tzin, which... Um, I've posted a lot of pictures from the wilderness of seen lately on Facebook and in the newsletters. It's a, it's a wonderful place, believe it or not, uh, to the expanse at the approach to Hamat. They ascended in the south, and he arrived at Hebron. And we've been talking about Hebron lately as the gateway to the lower garden. So, wow, we got real clues again to the lower garden. 
how the land of Israel itself, one reason we cannot slander it and say that we cannot ascend is because if we can't even in the natural realm say it's possible to ascend to Israel, to if we can't make a permanent aliyah, we can at least stick our toes in it as long as they'll let us before we pull our toe back out. Or we can keep our feasts wherever we are, just like we can keep Shabbat in the wilderness. We keep Shabbat in the wilderness. It's still an act of faith. If we keep a feast in the wilderness, it's still an act of faith that we are going up. Then when he gives us the opportunity, the last thing we're going to do is come back with a bad report. At this point, our good report is tied up in our commandment keeping. And along with that, you cannot pull this out of it, is our attitude in the wilderness. Are we walking in the commandment saying we can, can in Hebrew, can, 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 yes, 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 right? We can do it. We're not saying, no, 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 it's too high for us. We can't ascend. Who's going to go up into heaven and get the Torah for us? That's not faith. Moses said, it's near you. It's in your mouth. Everything keeps going back to our mouth. He's saying, quit slandering the Torah. Quit slandering the covenant. Quit slandering the land. Because when we're slandering the land, we're slandering the guy that told us to go there. And who told us we could ascend to the mountain from the south. From the wilderness of Tzim, we can ascend. And that journey that they took was not natural. If you count up the, the number of days that they traveled and all the land that they saw, it's a physical impossibility. But if they were in at least a semi-supernatural state on this journey as Moses sends them out, then it is possible that they spied the entire land. Why? Because time and space are not the same. They just aren't. Ask Yeshua. And so what they actually end up doing, we know how the shape of Israel is. They're in the south. They're in the wilderness of Tzim. They're in the extreme south. It's adjacent to the Negev. And that's going to be one thing they use to slander the land, is that the Amalekites are in the south. And the rabbi says like this, if you've ever been bitten by a snake, and sometime, any time after that, somebody comes up to you and says, ooh, there's a snake, you're gone the other way because you've already been bitten by the snake. So when they bring up Amalek in the Negev, what are they doing? It's very calculated. A heart that devises wicked plans because everybody who survived the Amalek attack remembers that snake. And that's going to dishearten and discourage them. What is discouragement? It means you take the courage out. Courage was in there, but you took it out. That's the power of a word. In a word, you can encourage and stick courage in there. Or you can disencourage, just like you can disembowel somebody. It means that you stick a knife in there and you take all their guts out. That's what discouragement and slander does. It gives people the mindset, especially if they're very impressionable and they're not strong in their faith. You're right, we can't do it. I remember Amalek, and that really hurt. I can't go back there again, right? Those are our accusers. The Amalekites, the Hittites, the 39 kings of Canaan. All of these groups that they come back and say are already there, those become your accusers because those become your reasons for saying, I can't do it. 
Those become your Satans. Those become your adversaries because you let them stand between you and the covenant with your eyes. How are you going to be distracted into slandering the land? You're going to be distracted by looking at the Amalekites. You're going to be distracted by looking at the Hittites. You're going to be distracted by looking at the giants. And instead of looking at the land and say, wow, you know, the only way you can live here is to be really, really strong. So think about how much stronger we're going to be than these people. So they, they start out and they go from the wilderness of Tzin. They're going to go basically due west toward the Mediterranean Sea. And then they're going to make a right turn and go up the coast to Hamat at the very north end. So basically all they're doing is a left angle, right angle. I can't remember. It's been too long since I had geometry. An L shape. <laughs> you math whizzes can fill that one in for me. They're basically doing an L shape of the land. You don't see the entire land following that path. But again, if they are in a semi-supernatural state, they can see everything. Why? Because it says they ascended. And they arrived. Those two words are very important. They ascended in the south and they arrived. Right? And the funny thing here, and the rabbis point this out, it says they ascended in the south and he arrived at Hebron. Who was he? It's clarified later that it was Caleb. Caleb. And Caleb was from the tribe of Judah. So later on in the apportioning of the land, Caleb uh, is still alive. <laughs> One of a couple <laughs> who's still alive. And he's assigned Hebron. So he, what is Judah supposed to be doing? Guarding the gateway to the garden. Why? Because Caleb was one who stuck his foot. He ascended. They all actually ascended, but he was the one who stuck his foot down in Hebron at the gateway into the lower garden where Yeshua has now opened that gate to us. Those who believe in his name, and his authority to save our souls without leaving the sin in it that would put us outside the camp so that we could be brought into the rivers. And he would give us drink, he said. If you're thirsty, come to me and drink. I will give you this water that was there that I described to you in Genesis 2. I want to give it to you. But you have to ascend. You have to quit saying, no, it can't be done. You have to say, it can be done. Yes, absolutely. So we can ascend with a lot of doubters, but who's he going to remember? When the land truly opens up, he's going to remember the one that put his foot down in Hebron and said, this is the gateway. And with Yeshua's help, Bezrat Hashem, I will go through this gateway with Yeshua. And he will lead me into my inheritance. There's a little rabbit trail there I'd love to chase because it says Hebron had been built seven years before Tzawan of Egypt, and we just won't have time today. Um, but it's, it's the turning of the Hebrew phrases that typically our English translation is, it doesn't give you the nuance. Um, and just, I guess to sum it up, what it means is that Hebron was not necessarily built seven years before Tzawan. It means it was seven times more fertile. Going back to the, the Hebrew roots in context. 
Um, so it was sevenfold better than Sawan in Egypt um, that Ham would have built for his sons, for Tsawan, who was descended from Ham. I guess that's a rabbit trail. We just don't have time to um, chase down. And so the spies go throughout the land, and the land, like we've been talking about the lower garden, to us it represents the garden. And although it's fallen, in this Torah portion, he mentions the Nephilim, the fallen ones. He gives us a contact point. But the land itself, and again, Shabbat and the Shemitah years and all these things are part of it. It's prophesying of a time when the adversaries and the accusers, all the reasons the spy says we couldn't ascend, when those things will be supernaturally removed. But think of the audacity, think of the chutzpah of these 10 spies. They say, well, you know, God took care of Pharaoh, but ain't no way he can drive these people out. You ever think of the impact of that statement? I mean, 10 plagues, he brought the most powerful nation on earth to its knees, stripped it of all its food, stripped it of its army, stripped it of its firstborn, parted the Reed Sea, brought them through on dry land, and they're saying, yeah, that, that was all right, but these 39 kings of Canaan, I don't, just, I don't think God's strong enough to do that. He had, he had a good run there for a while, but he just, he's not going to do this. It's like saying there is no resurrection from the dead. Because if Israel is that living earthly picture of our fall from the garden, then it's also that living earthly picture of our restoration and ascension to the lower garden, where we can be properly prepared for the next descent and to the upper garden. And so, you know, you want to talk about occupation in Israel. It's people who do not follow the Torah. It's people who slander the Torah. It's people who slander the land. It's people who slander the righteous. Those are the occupiers. And there's days you turn on the news and you say, wow, that's really a tough one. That's a tough one. Because there's no nation on earth that can number her accusers in the same numbers as Israel. That's a clue. There is no people on earth who can number their accusers in greater numbers than a Jew. And that's been true through history. It's not changed generationally. Name a generation where everybody was really glad that Jews are on earth. <laughs> there's not one. Who's really glad that there's a nation called Israel on earth? Not many. But there are a few who say two out of 12, we can. She will. She will prevail over her enemies because she's not going to win by the strength of her own hand. She's going to win by the supernatural hand of her covenant husband who is going to bring her in. These obstacles are not insurmountable. Because to say otherwise, to say that those obstacles of sin that exist right now in the land of Israel, to say that those who occupy that land, to say that those who wish harm and evil to that land are greater than the hand of the Holy One in her defense and his ability to restore and to bring up into the cloud his people. If you say anything other than total success is coming, to Israel, the covenant, the land, the people, then you are a slanderer, you are evil, and you are a wicked spy. 
and you will wander and wander and wander and die in your closed circle of evil speech until you decide this is not the place I want to be. Father, show me how to get out of this loop. <laughs> I want to get in the other loop. I want to get in the menorah loop and say, we can ascend. What did Caleb say? We shall surely ascend and conquer it, for we can surely do it. But the men who had ascended with him said, we cannot ascend. For that people, it is stronger than us. Basically, they're saying it's stronger than God. Talk about a fall. But again, ascend, ascend. Um, where was it? Back in chapter 13, verse 17, twice. Ascend, ascend. Go up, go up. Right? Remember, there's two clouds in the wilderness. It's actually more than two, but we'll focus on two. Because there is a cloud that covers them. The Torah portion talks about a cloud that covers them. There's a pillar of cloud that leads them. But when we are faithful, which is why I wanted you to read Hebrews 11 and 12, then you become part of the great cloud of witnesses. So the cloud below reflects the cloud above. And the cloud above is called the shade, the cell, the shadow. But it's a shadow of protection. But what Caleb and Hosea, who was called Yehoshua by Moses, they say that the shade, the counterpart to what the Israelites have, they have a cloud of shade and protection, the divine presence over them. But they say the shade, the protection of the people in this land has departed from them. You're seeing the strength of the people, but you've got to understand that those dark forces that protected them have already fled. They don't have their backup. We still got ours. We still got our shade. But see, when you start slandering with your tongue, the cloud doesn't want to be there. In fact, the cloud gets really upset. <laughs> And then when it appears, it says it, has start, it appeared in the tabernacle, it's a pretty fearsome thing. Why? The Holy One became so angry, he's ready to wipe them all out. Not only do you not get a cloud, you may not get a you. You want to be sinful? I'll let you die in your sin and deal with what comes after that. Instead of putting your foot in the doorway to the garden, I'll let you work it out down in Sheol. And you might want to take some warm weather gear. <laughs> and it's, it's just like with the spies. It was just like Yeshua addressed a certain group of Pharisees who were hypocrites. He said, you're not entering in, and you're not letting others enter in either. So you've got double sin. You don't want to go in, but you're not satisfied with just your own unbelief you want to discourage you want to rip the courage out of everyone else so they can't get in either you want them to stay down there on your deathly fleshly level and oh my goodness there's so much to cover we just hit an hour um when moses is asking them or telling them what to look for. I like to show you the metaphors when I can. He asks them several questions in chapter 13, where after he says, ascend, ascend. He says, see the land, what is it? And the people that dwells in it, is it strong, is it weak, is it few, or is it numerous? And how is the land in which it dwells? Is it good or is it bad? And how are the cities in which it dwells? 
Is it in open cities or fortified cities? How is the land? Is it fertile? Is it lean? Are there trees in it or not? You shall strengthen yourselves and take from the fruit of the land. All right. When he says, are there trees in it or not? That's a mistranslation. If that's what yours reads uh, in verse 20, it's wrong. If you've got a Hebrew edition, look over at the Hebrew. And what he actually says is, Hayesh ba'etz. Etz is singular. Etzim is plural. It doesn't say etzim. It says etz. Is there a tree in it or not? Do you see the heaviness of that statement when you read it in the original language? Is there a tree in it or not? So it takes us, number one, right back to the tree. We got a tree of life. And we've also got the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And here's the crazy thing with these spies. They started their lives with the truth. Isn't that how the tree of the knowledge of good and evil works? It starts the lie with a fact. And they said, it is indeed a land flowing with milk and honey. But what follows it is total lies because of the way that they place the words. So if you want to tell a really good lie, start with a fact. I'm not educating you on good lie telling, by the way. If you want to sift through a lie, don't be deceived by the fact that they start with a fact. Every good lie will start with a fact. Sure, it's just like we were told, it's flowing with milk and honey, but, <laughs> I shouldn't be saying this, but, <laughs> uh -uh. it also, the rabbis also say, that it's, he's asking them to look for one righteous man. Is there one righteous man? Because trees are compared to people. And so remember with Abraham, he kept bargaining and finally got down to 10 righteous men. If there's 10 righteous men, it could withhold the judgment. He said, is there one righteous man in this land? And if so, they were to go to this righteous person and establish contact. Uh, that to them is the, the subtext of it. Let's see, what else have I got marked in here that I thought was really cool? We shall surely ascend. Oh. They're comparing this Torah portion because it emphasizes so many a times ascending to the land. And just like he says, ascend, as he's giving them instructions, he says, ascend from the south. And he says, ascend to the mountain. So we know what, when we think mountain, we think Sinai, the giving of the Torah, the giving of the covenant. Um, it says Moses in the commentary, uh, Rashi commentary, it says Moses ascended to heaven itself to receive the Torah. And you say, well, all he did was go up the mountain. Uh-huh. You see how close it is? The levels of heaven. We tend to think of heaven as being way out there in the stratosphere. There's different levels of heaven. Paul was caught up into the third and couldn't even talk about it. So he goes up to a level, possibly into the lower garden when he goes up to that mountain, into the cloud. And they're saying that, that what Caleb is telling the people, and they're translating for him or putting words in his mouth, that even though we don't have the natural ability to enter the land of Canaan right now, if Moses instructs us, or if the Torah instructs us to do so, it says, we will make ladders and ascend even to the heavens, meaning we will ascend to a plane beyond the natural, where natural cause and effect, as we understand it, does not apply. Right? In other words, they're saying, 
the Holy One didn't bring us out of Egypt by natural means. He brought us out by supernatural, miraculous means. And if the Holy One through Moses is telling us to go into the land, then we will ascend also using there the ladders. There is that metaphor, like the angels of God ascending and descending. Then we can do that. And they said that had Israel gone into the land at that moment, they would have entered into the lower garden. Had they been obedient and not lost faith at that critical moment, which tells us again how serious it is to speak against the land and to slander the, slander the land because we're slandering the very covenant of Moses. Um, let's see. We talked about how the prosecutors were the Am Amalekites, Hittites, Amorites, the 39 kings of Canaan. Um, and Caleb makes an interesting statement. He's contradicting the evil spies. And he says, don't worry about it. He says, they will be our bread. Now, now, that's And we can clarify it and even recall some things we said that we read in the book of Revelation either a week before, uh, maybe earlier than that, I don't remember which week, but we talked about, maybe it was last week, we talked about the, the unclean birds being used as equivalent expressions to demons and unclean spirits. So an unclean bird, don't look at an unclean bird and say, ooh, that's an unclean spirit. It represents, okay, an unclean spirit. Don't be shooting all the crows in your yard. They will be your bread. That's what Caleb is saying, because it relates to 1 Kings 17, 4. Remember when we read the little account there about Elijah, when we talked about the 144,000? how Elijah, who thinks he's the only one left, he runs south. He runs down into the wilderness, into the desert. But it was actually the ravens, the unclean birds, who represent your accusers, your adversaries, who came and brought him bread. The birds fed him. And that's what Caleb is trying to tell the Israelites. Your very accusers, your very adversaries that stand between you and encouragement, what did the ravens do? They encouraged him that God hadn't forgotten. And so at those moments sometimes when you feel like God's forgotten me, you're having your Job moment, sometimes your very adversary will show up in your office or call you on the phone or send you a text and you're thinking, when did they get nice? <laughs> I've had it happen. Like, there is no explanation for why this person is being nice to me right now. But then when you read what Caleb is saying and what happened with Elijah, that in a time of tribulation, in a time of distress, in a time when you say it can't be done, he will send your very adversary to encourage you and to feed you at that moment and you're like this has got to be supernatural because this person ain't naturally doing nothing for me <laughs> what does he say he will make even your enemies to be at peace with you and if that's what it takes at that moment to put the courage back into you and to turn you back around and say i can go into the land he will make even dark forces because see he can make the devil do it you might say, the devil made me do it. No, he didn't. But the Holy One can make the devil do anything. He has the authority, just like Yeshua. Yeshua had the authority, and they're like, what do we got to do with you? Why? They had to obey. They didn't have a choice. All right. And so if the Holy One tells an unclean spirit to help you, it can. And that's what Caleb is saying. Look. He says, uh, their protection, I don't know where the verse is now. 
he actually says their protection has departed from them. The evil forces that have been kind of shepherding them have already left. I don't know what verse is it. You can look it up later. But uh, And I love that, actually. Because it makes sense. Here it is. Uh, 14, 9. Or it's, it, Caleb is, um, well, Joshua and Caleb are talking. Um, and it says, the land is very, very good. They're answering Moses' question, is the land good? Remember, the first description of the land is good gold. Remember that from the rivers of Eden? Good gold. Right? So he says, the land is very, very good. If Hashem desires us, he will bring us to this land and give it to us. He's saying, if he desires us. Well, obviously he desires Israel because he sent them in. A land that flows with milk and honey, but do not rebel against Hashem. And you will not fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them. Hashem is with us. Do not fear them. In other words, don't fear people who don't even have their back up. And, uh, it's interesting then they're trying to inflict the judgment here upon Caleb and Joshua. I think it was Caleb speaking at this point. They're wanting to inflict the punishment upon Joshua that should rightfully be inflicted upon the Sabbath breaker. You see how wickedness works? Caleb was the one who put his foot down in Hebron and said, I want this because it represents the resurrection and it represented his faith in Yeshua before he even came face to face with Yeshua. It represented his faith in resurrection and he is making a case for the resurrection right here. We can ascend. And then, of course, Moses has to intercede, and I guess we can finish up with this. Uh, because Adonai, it says, he says, I will smite them with plague and annihilate them. I shall make you a greater and more powerful nation than they. He's really angry. Why? Because he's offered them not just the land itself. He's offering them the ascension into the lower garden. And they don't think he's strong enough. Moses said to Hashem, Then Egypt will hear, He from whose midst you brought up this nation with your power, and they will say about the inhabitants of this land, having heard that you, Hashem, are in the midst of this people. That should remind you again about Yeshua being in the midst or the middle of the lampstand. You, Hashem, are in the midst of this people that you, Hashem, appeared eye to eye and your cloud stands over them and that in the pillar of cloud you go before them by, by day and in a pillar of cloud at night. And if you were to put this people to death like a single man, then the nations that heard of your fame would say, and it goes on. I just want to point out a couple of things. Last night we read Hebrews 11 and 12 that made us understand that all the faithful whose souls are under the altar, they were not finished. Their sacrifice is not finished. Their collective identity is not finished, it says, apart from us. What is he saying? until the last soul of righteousness has been added to that body, the body of Messiah, nobody's made perfect. When that last soul comes in and 
I don't know what that number is. The Father knows what that number of souls is. When that last soul is added under the altar, at that moment, the resurrection can pl take place. Because remember, they're saying, how long, O oh Lord, until you avenge us upon our enemies? They don't care about their enemies anymore. They care about the resurrection. The enemies were only the adversaries that stood in place of courage to go into the land, to say that there will be a resurrection, that we will be invited into the lower garden, that we will pass through Hebron. The tombs of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Leah, that we will go through there and go into the garden. For Yeshua said, Miriam, why are you weeping? Quit crying. Quit crying. Why? Because I've opened the gateway to you. I was that cloud of protection. I was that shade that was over you. I was that shade at your right hand. I was the pillar of cloud that went before you. I was the one who was in the midst of you by day and by night. And so when he says, if you were to put this people to death like a single man, he's giving us a hint here that we get in hindsight because John gave us that clue in Revelation that in terms of the resurrection, it will not take place until every soul is collected into a single man. We, we hear about one new man all the time, but it's not a new concept. It's right here in the Torah that our living and our dying is as a single man. Our resurrection is as a single man. And he goes on and makes the argument that, you know, in view of the resurrection, um, have mercy. And that's what Yeshua does. He protects us even when we're discouraged, when we say our adversaries are stronger than he is. And I'd just like to encourage you, and I didn't get to the Song of Songs, because remember the tzitzit that were commanded? Uh, it goes back to a passage in the Song of Songs. But the good news is we've got another Torah portion coming up in Bamidbar, that is also thematically tied into the lattice and the tzitzit and the kotel, believe it or not, because it's that same word where it talks about the, the beloved and the lattices. Um, that same word is the kotel at the Wailing Wall. And it helps us understand why that particular wall has stood even after destruction 2,000 years later, that particular retaining wall of the temple still stands. And when you stand there and pray at the wall, who's on the other side? Peering through the lattice. Um, it's a great little language study, but it, it does relate to the wells. Remember, there's this weird song later in numbers and weird because we don't have context for it. And it, it talks about spring up a well. And we've talked about Miriam and the well and the three things that were given in the merit of Moses and Aaron and Miriam and what that well did to the enemy, to the accuser. And it says that the people didn't understand that their salvation had been there all along. It's an awesome thing, but we'll, we'll do it when we get, let's see which Torah portion it's in. It might be in Chukat, I believe so. I believe it's a couple ahead of us where we got Korach next week. 
and then after that chukat. So when we get to chukat, we'll talk about spring up a well, and um, there's a lot of water stuff. If you'll remember, because of the the red heifer and that Torah portion, but it's it's a beautiful analogy there of the resurrection. And sometimes we're, we're worried about our Jewish brothers and sisters who don't recognize Yeshua. And in that little poem, that little song, in that Torah portion, you can understand how a people could have been saved all along and not realized it until there was this revelation. And basically the bodies of their enemies, the will brings them up where they can see them. That all along, the well has been fighting for you. And then they recognize, oh my goodness, there was our salvation all along. And uh, very encouraging because again, there's a lot of ugly things I think that get out there and circulate among Hebrew roots people about our Jewish brothers and sisters. And that sort of slander should not be taking place. We need to be encouraging ourselves, encouraging one another's, and that will take all your energy. It'll take more energy than you have, trust me. <laughs> okay.